Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for joining us for this Certificate Connection webinar. I'm Kevin Keller, the CEO of CFP Board. During today's webinar, we'll have updates from this week's board meeting here uh, in Utah. We'll review the progress we've made to refresh CFP Board's strategic priorities. We'll update you on the nominations process for the new board of directors whose term will begin in January of 2022. We'll share some updates on our strengthened enforcement process. And most importantly, and I think always the fun part, is that we will answer your questions. So before we get started, though, I'd like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. If you run into any issues with the audio, or if it seems like the slides are out of sync, you should refresh your webinar console. Press F5 for those of you, uh, press F5, I'm sorry, or for those of you on a Mac, hit Command R. There's a Q&A function on your screen that you can use to submit questions to us at any time during the program. We'll address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session. And at the uh, end of the program, if we don't get to your question, we'll follow up with you after the fact. Joining me today are two distinguished CFP professionals. Doug King is the 2021 Chair of the Board, and Camila Elliott is the Chair-Elect. She'll be Chair of the Board next year. Thank you all for joining us. And so, Doug, why don't you start us off with an update from the Director's meeting that just wrapped up. Sure, Kevin. I'd be happy to. So I'm, first of all, pleased to share that our Board meeting this week was held in person just outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. This was the first board meeting that we've held in person since March of 2020, and it's been great to be back in the same space with all of my colleagues. The main focus of this week's meeting was to wrap up the strategy refresh process, which we've been engaged in for the past couple of years. Here you see a high-level view of that process. Because the CFP board has an important role in advancing the entire profession, we took a broad, professional-wide perspective before narrowing down to the areas where the CFP board can make the most impact. The process really started in December 2019 on the 50th anniversary of a pivotal meeting that was considered the birth of the financial planning profession. We convened a forum of nearly 100 leaders from across the financial advice ecosystem to discuss the future of financial advice and develop a shared picture of success for that profession. From there, we drill down to specific roles the CFP board does or should play with regard to different parts of the future vision aligned with their mission to benefit the public. I'm pleased to share that the board has adopted a new framework for the CFP board's new strategic plan. That framework is made up of five strategic priorities, which we visualized with the five block diagram that you see here. At the center, we have standards and certification. We have blocks for access and awareness, which cover areas that are part of our current strategic priorities. And we have blocks for workforce development and for engagement with regard to both regulatory and community engagement. I'd like to walk you through some of the CFP Board's activities and initiatives that relate to each priority. First, our standards and certification priority. CFP Board sets, administers, and enforces certification standards that warrant public trust. This priority is intentionally positioned in the center, as it is the CFP Board's primary business. This encompasses all of our work to set and uphold competency standards. That includes developing the principal knowledge topics list that is at the center of the educational requirements for the CFP certification. It also includes developing and administering the CFP exam, as well as upholding the experience standards for initial certification. This priority also includes our work to set and uphold high ethical standards for CFP professionals, and it includes our important work to enforce those ethical standards. Next, we have the priority of access. CFP Board expands access to competent and ethical financial planners by increasing the number and diversity of CFP professionals. This encompasses all of the candidate marketing and candidate support and resources that the CFP Board provides. 
It also includes much of the work of our Center for Financial Planning and its work to expand gender and racial diversity in the profession. And it includes our work to encourage pro bono financial planning, which expands access to competent and ethical financial planners within underserved communities. With more than 90,000 CFP professionals around the country, CFP Board effectively has a supply of advisors for the pro bono opportunities identified and organized by our friends at the Foundation for Financial Planning. Next, we have the priority of workforce. CFP Board developed a sustainable and diverse financial planner workforce. It encompasses the work of our corporate relations team, which is engaged with helping firms find solutions to ensure their financial advisor workforce is serving the needs of their clientele. This team has helped many firms institutionalize CFP certification as part of their hiring and professional development processes. The workforce priority also includes the career path guides developed by the center. The first guide was focused on helping firms develop internal career paths that support and meet expectations of the advisor workforce. Later this year, the center will release a new career path guide designed for individuals just entering the profession. And the workforce priority includes a number of other initiatives, including the great scholarship programs administered by the center. Next, we have the priority of awareness. CFP board increases awareness of CFP certification and the must-have financial planner credentials for consumers and advisors. This retains an important area of emphasis from CFP board's prior strategic plan with our public awareness campaign as the primary initiative. The new priority statement also makes clear that we're not focused exclusively on consumer awareness, but also on awareness among advisors. This also encompasses work, the work of our corporate relations team and our communications with candidates and stakeholders, all of which are designed to provide value to financial advisors. And finally, we have the priority of community and regulatory engagement. CFP Board engages the financial advice ecosystem to advance the financial planner profession and influences policy for the benefit of the public. CFP Board's public policy activity is central to this priority, along with all of the coalition building work that is involved from the financial planning coalitions to the Friends of Fiduciary Group and others. CFP Board will continue to advocate for a uniform fiduciary standard for, for, for financial advice and pursue other work designed to advance the recognition of financial planning as an established profession. This priority also encompasses other collaborative activities, including the meetings and conferences the CFP Board hosts, such as the Academic Research Colloquium, Diversity Summits, and many more. So there you have a quick overview of the CFP's new strategic plan, which will guide the organization's work for the next five years or so. With our strategic priorities in place, we'll be establishing significant multi-year outcomes for each priority and mapping out a, out a plan to achieve those outcomes. The board has tasked the staff with developing an annual operation plan, organizational goals, and a budget for each year that remains in place. And the board will receive reports from the progress towards these new priorities at each of our regular meetings. We also look forward to continuing our work with leaders across the financial services industry to advance our shared vision for the future of financial planning profession with roundtable meetings and coalitions. Through this process, we've not only updated the framework for CFP Board's work over the next few years, but we're also addressing key issues that impact the profession. Doug, you know, uh, I think the, the new framework with the five blocks, while it, it pays homage to where we've been in the past, uh, at least I detected a good bit of uh, excitement among the board about the way we've laid that out. Yeah, we've put a lot of work and effort into that, and I can't tell you how proud I am of uh, of all the work of all the board members as well as their entire staff. Well, you know, and, and the other thing is we've put this together, and as we started back in Chicago in, uh, in 2019, as you talked about, and as we've gone forward, we've tried to make it as inclusive a process as possible. We included... You know, that fifth square that you talked about was engagement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see a, a, a real role for CFP Board engaging the broader ecosystem, and we've done that in creating this very plan. So I, I, I know the staff is excited about it. 
My sense of the board was too. We are as well, and we certainly hope that the uh, everyone within the CFC community is engaged as well. It's really going to be a team effort. You know, Doug, uh, one of the things that the board has done, it has spoken with great clarity about the direction that you want. So the the way our governance is set up is that you you know the board sets the direction and and works on the strategy and staff then operationalizes that and one of the ways that at least from the staff perspective and just and saying this for over the last <clears throat> uh, 13 or 14 years part of our success a big part of the success is the fact that the board has been so clear with us at the staff level about what it wants to accomplish and it makes it much more easy to 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 be successful when when there's a shared vision of what success looks like before you you start out. Yeah, that shared vision is uh, not just the vision of our board, but it's it's uh, all of the great work from the hundreds of people that have really communicated with us over the last 18 months. Indeed, you know, Camille, you've been uh, busy on the leading the nominating committee, so. Uh, Please give our listeners an update of how that process is going. Certainly, Kevin. And as chair-elect of the board, I lead the board's nominating committee, and we've been hard at work reviewing applications from prospective new board members. Last year, as part of our comprehensive governance review, the board made a number of updates to our nominations process. A key change was to take a more holistic view of the professional skills, experience, and knowledge needed on the board and its committees. We want to make sure the board has a diversity of experience, viewpoints, and representation necessary for good governance. Earlier this year, the nominating committee, again, retained an executive search consultant to conduct a gap analysis. We used the results of that analysis to develop a comprehensive, descriptive profile for future board candidates. Here you can see the descriptive profile we developed for 2022 board candidates. It is very specific about the characteristics we are seeking in new board members for 2022. These complement the characteristics of the existing board members and fill gaps in the board's composition. It's important that these characteristics are specific to this year's nominating process. They will be updated each year as board members roll off and we identify new gaps to be filled. So if you're interested in serving on the board but didn't fit the characteristics we sought out for this year's candidates, there's a good chance you'll meet those that we're looking for in future years. So this year's application deadline was in June, and this week we worked on making a short list of eligible candidates. We will hold interviews with candidates between mid-August and October. The board will elect the new board directors at our November meeting, and these new directors will begin their terms in January of 2022. We appreciate everyone who took time to submit an application. While our criteria was very specific this year, the call for nominations had a great response as we received a total of 99 applications. Serving on the Board of Directors provides a great opportunity not only to guide CFP Board's important work to benefit the public, but to make an impact on the financial planning profession. You know, thank you so much, Camila, for leading this process. I'm always impressed. Again, uh, almost a hundred people, and we were very specific. You know, there were four main ca four main areas that we were looking for, and still we had almost a hundred uh, applications. So I think that's just great. We should remind our listeners that this will be the first uh, class of board members to serve a three-year term. Uh, previously, and for as long as I know, it's been one four-year term, and the Governance uh, Committee last year conducted a complete review of our nominating and election process. Do you want to talk just a little bit more? So it's, what, it's one three-year term, but 
um, the opportunity to serve a second third-year term. Um, and one thing that we realize, or three-year term, I should say, um, we realize the fact that there's value in having experience on the CFP board. Um, we know it's a time commitment. Um, however, we would like the opportunity for those that have the time and have the expertise um, and experience we're looking for, they can now serve a total of six years on the CFP board. And it also provides a great pipeline for leadership. Um, as you know, leadership on the board is extremely important, work closely with you, um, but it gives the opportunity for people to understand and learn the board a little bit longer before stepping into the chair and chair-elect role. Well, great. Thank you, Camila. Uh, before we get to questions, uh, I want to share an update on work that we've done to strengthen our enforcement process. In fact, Marjorie Fox asked a question about, uh, you know, if we were going to address what's going on with enforcement, so I think this would be a good time to, to spend a little time there. CFP boards uh, setting and enforcing of ethical standards for CFP professionals is truly one of our, I think, most important functions. CFP Board has dedicated significant resources to the multi-year process that led to our new code and standards, and then more recently, our updated procedural rules. The standards and responsibilities outlined in our Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct are central to our mission to benefit the public. And it's essential for us to maintain the public trust for us to enforce the code and standards rigorously and effectively. When the Wall Street Journal published an article back in the summer of 2019 that criticized elements of our enforcement process, all of us at CFP Board took that very seriously. We didn't agree with all of the article's claims, but we took immediate action to address the issues that were raised in that article. We responded publicly to the Wall Street Journal article with several commitments that we made good on. We established an independent task force on enforcement that reviewed all aspects of our enforcement process and provided actionable recommendations. We ended the practice of relying primarily on self-disclosure by CFP professionals to detect potential misconduct. We began checking broker check and all other sources of public information every time a CFP professional renews certification. And we updated our website to provide consumers with direct access to broker check and other sources of public information that a consumer should be aware of before choosing a CFP professional to work with. We've also focused on more robust detection of potential misconduct. While we no longer primarily rely on self-disclosure by CFP professionals, Self-disclosure is still an important part. An ethics attestation is required as part of the certification renewal, and our new code and standards includes a duty to report certain information to CFP board within 30 days. We've also revamped our processes for detecting potential misconduct. We increased the number of public databases we reviewed and have automated that review when possible to get the most timely information. Last year, we completed an updated background check on every CFP professional, and we opened historical investigations into the conduct of about 1.4% of our CFP professionals. That led to the opening of 1,266 investigations. Many of those cases have already made it all the way through the adjudication process. You probably saw our latest uh, sanctions news release in late June, where we announced 40 new public sanctions. 
and fully half of those were outcomes from those historical investigations. At the staff level, we've bifurcated the detection and investigation functions from the adjudication and appeals functions and made considerable staff and financial investments in our enforcement functions, contrary to what some of our critics have claimed. For example, Tom Sporkin is an attorney who joined us in January as our first ever Managing Director of Enforcement. He leads our detection and investigation efforts and comes to us with 20 years of experience in the SEC's Enforcement Division. We've also increased the number of volunteers who support the enforcement function, doubling the size of our Disciplinary and Ethics Commission to allow for more frequent hearing sessions. In fact, we have hearings every month as we're working through these historical investigations. That helps make sure that we're being as expedient as possible. To date this year, we've issued sanctions, public sanctions, against 125 individuals which is a 48% increase over last year. To be clear, look, uh, our goal is not to issue more sanctions. However, the increase in sanctions this year is a clear reflection of our strengthened detection efforts and the surge of historical investigations going through the process. You know, one of the things, I want to just talk a minute. If you've ever been to the FINRA website, they have a list of financial designations and certifications. There are 213 different designations, including ones you would know, like CFP, CPA, CFA, but there are hundreds, several hundred more, many of which you may never have heard of. And while uh, each of those, the way FINRA has organized that website, they actually uh, list those certifications that have public, publicly identified the people they have sanctioned. We've done a thorough review of the 215, and when the last time we looked, there were only four designations or licenses that actually had websites where you could see public uh, sanctions against their cer certification or designation holders. CFA does it. They do a good job. We work closely with our friends down in Charlottesville. Uh, the, the, attorney, or the accountants do it, the certified public accountants. Uh, SEMA has a few people that they've uh, d disciplined. And then CFP. CFP has publicly sanctioned on its website more than all of the other designations uh, combined that are on the FINRA website. You know, look, all of us, and Doug, I hear it at the board meeting, you're, you're unambiguous, all of us at CFP board are steadfast in our commitment to strengthening the enforcement program for the public's benefit. And we continue to follow through on that commitment. Doug, I, you know, one of the points, and we talk a lot about this, and it's that fact that w the enforcement is to enforce our standards. Say more about that. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that's interesting. Uh, we're going to talk a couple of questions that have come up on that very thing, but um, enforcement's a scary word, and I say this a lot to um, not only Kevin, but our entire uh, staff, especially those in the enforcement side. And it's really critically important to understand what that means. Um, we're enforcing our standards. It's, it's our standards. It's ones that we set for, for our certified financial planner professionals. And that's really what it is. And if we don't have and set high standards, then honestly, what good is the CFP designation? So it's important and, and uh, critical to understand that that's really what the enforcement's about, enforcing the standards that we've set and, uh, and which almost, almost exclusively all of you 
uh, are very proud to have those high standards. You know, Doug, one of the one of the issues that comes up, and I know that from time to time, uh, people you know uh, ask questions. There are a lot of there are times where there are uh, customer complaints that you know don't pan out, but people you know, and, and we look at them as well, but that never go. So you know, one of the things that people say, and there were you know, when when the Wall Street article came out, there were you know six thousand. Uh, reports, but we we looked at every CFP, and many of those were were not worthy of following up on our part. You you yeah. run a business, you've been in this business a long time. Sure. Well, so think about that. Um, you know, Finra has a job to do, and and they work hard to do that job. And one of the things that 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 is, it's a self regulatory organization, and so they've got high standards too. And one of those standards is if somebody has a complaint then we uh, don't have a choice. Your, your broker-dealer, your RAA, they have to do a write-up, and, they, and it's reportable, and it's public, and it goes online. And that's out there before you even get a chance to defend yourself. And in many, many times, when the facts come out and when things really come about, um, there is actually nothing there. And uh, the case gets dismissed or nothing really happens. And yet, you know, it was out there for that period of time. And we have a requirement that if, if something like that does happen, you're supposed to let us know. We have people that look into those things. We're watching them. But we're not going to start an enforcement investigation. We're not going to get into your lives. We're not going to disrupt your firms and the jobs they have to, to do the research and get to the bottom of this. But we are going to expect and want you to be informed along the way. And when and if something happens where there was public harm or there was something that needs to be uh, dealt with from an enforcement standpoint as it relates to our standards, then we're going to take action. And so to your point, Kevin, you know, the 6,000 plus uh, folks that were listed there, I think more than 4,000 fell into that category, yeah. you know, so. Well, <clears throat> you know, this year we're also addressing the consequences for CFP professionals who fail to comply with our code and standards. Our new Commission on Sanctions and Fitness will review and recommend changes to our sanction guidelines and fitness standards. These documents outline what sanctions or consequences uh, are considered appropriate for specific types of conduct. As the Commission continues its work, we'll be reaching out to stakeholders for input. Later this month, We'll be requesting your comments on the first set of proposed changes to those sanctioned guidelines. So we ask that you keep an eye out for the request for comments and take some time to consider and share your feedback. I know our friends at FPA and NAPFA will be looking at that and providing us feedback on uh, their view as well, but we welcome broad feedback on the proposals. So uh, we've um, covered a lot so far this afternoon. Let's get into the questions that we have. Um, the first one up is about enforcement. Doug, I'll, I'll direct this one to you. Tom asks, uh, with all of the talk about enforcement, is CFP Board, and I get this question, so I'm going to give it to you, is CFP Board trying to become a regulator? Um, no. The short answer is no, we're not. Uh, as I just said, uh, we have a job to do, and that's to enforce our own standards. And so while our enforcement activities serve a function similar to regulators, the CFP board is a certifying and standard-setting organization. We're not a regulatory body. Matter of fact, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we have a mission to benefit the public. So enforcing our own standards for CFP professionals is a key benefit to that mission of serving the public. And standards don't mean much if they're not enforced. So the board does take its responsibility to enforce and uphold our mission very seriously. And that's why we've taken actions in recent years to modernize and strengthen our enforcement process. The CFP board is committed to maintaining an enforcement process that's fair to those whose conduct is being evalu evaluated and credible to the public. And so, again, we're um, not not a gotcha organization at all. We're gonna 
protected. And, and, and I will, the only thing I would add to that, and we talked about this at the board meeting and it's changes that we've made at, you know, since the new code and standards has, have come out, there is a duty to report. And that duty to report, we're going to talk a little bit more about that here today, but that duty to report, you know, there's still an obligation. If something arises, let us know. We will look at it. We, we may open a, a case or not, but uh, we need to report, and there's a 30-day timeline. Uh, Doug, another question for you. Um, Mary asks, what investments or strategies will CFP Board make to further enhance enforcement activities that benefit the public? Okay. Seems to be a popular question these days, so thank you, Mary, for asking that. Well, so in addition to the considerable staff and financial investments that Kevin mentioned earlier, enforcement was a big part of the board's strategy refresh discussions. We put the certification and standards priority squarely in the center of our new strategic priorities to emphasize its core mission and business. And enforcement is an essential part of fulfilling that mission to benefit the public. So to give you an example, last year the board authorized a $5 million investment to complete the investigations and adjudication of the historical investigations uh, resulted in the background checks conducted for all the CFP professionals. And that work continues throughout the rest of this year. Our Commission on Sanctions and Fitness is hard at work reviewing and recommending changes to our sanctions guidelines and fitness standards. Our staff is working to update the ethics attestation to help ensure that it will effectively capture the type of conduct that needs to be reviewed through that enforcement process. And the work that's been done to strengthen our processes to detect potential misconduct, that enforcement team is planning to work with a third-party auditor to verify that those processes are fully detecting the types of matters that we're designed to detect. So you'll be hearing more about that in coming months and years on the CFP Board's work to strengthen its enforcement activities for the benefit of the public. You know, the, we, we got a question here. Melissa asks, um, you know, is it, she said, it's my understanding that only those customer complaints that are deemed to have merit by a supervising entity would be reportable. Uh, she goes on to say a general complaint from a customer that has no merit would would not be. We still want to know about that. We're going to look at it, and our 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 obligation is to look at that. So, Melissa, it's not you know the the we want to know there are there are uh, a number of obligations that we have listed uh, in our code of code and standards that relate to reportable matters and they're organized there. We actually have guidance available to the entire CFP community. It's a guide on the duty to report information to CFP board. I would encourage you, you can, get, you can look directly, Melissa, at that uh, uh, guide. It's CFP board, CFP rather, cfp.net slash guidance. So, Melissa, uh, more information there, but everything from tax liens, bankruptcies, customer complaints, termination, and that, that obligation, and it's new this, with the new code and standards, is within 30 days. Camila, uh, Ron asks, could you outline the proper protocol for reporting matters? So, lots of questions, and this is a good thing because... We talked earlier that we will be uh, uh, distributing for public comment uh, sanctions, and, and the one that will be out within the next month will be on uh, sanctions for failure to report. But Ron asked, could you outline the proper protocol? Thank you, Kevin. And as you mentioned earlier, with our new code and standards, CFP professionals are required to report information to the CFP board regarding an expanded number of, of events such as regulatory actions, lawsuits, or arbitrations alleging professional misconduct, bankruptcy, and federal tax liens. A CFP professional must provide written notice to the CFP board within 30 days of both the initiation and conclusion of the reportable matter and include a narrative statement that accurately and completely describes the material facts and the outcome or status of the reportable matter. To make this type of report, 
we have an online reporting form that is located at dsp.net forward slash ethics forward slash reporting. When we receive one of these reports, the CFP Board's enforcement team will review the information provided, conduct a check of public databases for possible additional information, and then follow the investigation process outlined in our procedural rules, which begins with the delivery of a notice of investigation to the CFP professional. Camila, thank you so much. You know, there are a lot of rumors out there, and I'm not sure how some of these get started, guys, but I'm going to take one on here. Josh writes, someone told me I could not use CFP or Certified Financial Planner in my email signature. And I'm not sure, Josh, who told you that, but uh, we want you to use it properly. So uh, the proper way to use it would be Josh and your last name, comma, CFP with the circle R for the registered trademark. Or you could use Josh and your last name, certified financial planner with a TM for the trademark. So, Josh, we so take that one. Can, can I bring one thing, though? Yeah, I was going to say, there are some firms that may not allow that. That's, good, that's a good but Check with compliance. Check Thank with you. Compliance and also social media. That's one thing I do see is that insurer, you should not have in the title of your name CFP. Correct, absolutely. And so we have, Josh, I would, I would direct you to our Mark's Use Guide. And you can do that. Uh, you can access that Mark's Use Guide, cfp.net slash marks. Did you have another thought on this? I mean, yeah, we we're kind of just talking that. among ourselves yeah. here about the compliance. When I mentioned social media, I'm referring to Twitter, Instagram, right. Facebook. You can use LinkedIn as long as you're using the, the copyright or trademark symbol, but your name should not on on. You it know, shouldn't have CFP. It shouldn't have CFP behind it. In there, you can use like for Twitter. I see yours. You have your Twitter handle, mm -hmm. but then when you have your name, it's Camila Elliott. Comma, CFP. Correct, but your Twitter handle should not have yeah. CFP, CFP embedded yeah. in it. Absolutely. Correct. Camille, another question for you. Um, what do we do if we suspect a violation of the code and standards by another CFP professional? So if you become aware of a CFP professional who appears to be violating this or other standards, we have a process whereby you or a client impacted by the violation can file a complaint with the CFP board. There is an online form for filling a complaint on our website at cfp.net forward slash complaint. CFP does accept anonymous complaints, but sometimes a, a, a complainant's anonymity may prevent CFP board from conducting a full investigation. You know, one of the issues uh, that the, the detection team comes across sometimes is that, you know, a, another CFP professional may get a new client, and they suspect that uh, there may have been violations of our standards, but they don't want to file a complaint. They can ask the client to file that complaint directly with us as well. So that's a, a, an opportunity. Um, Mark uh, raises an issue with continued globalization. What is CFP Board doing to promote CFP certification in other countries? And how can U.S.-based CFP professionals get involved in that initiative? So, look, uh, there, are, there are more. Let's start with the fact that there are more CFP professionals outside the U.S., than there are in the U.S. It started here, but it's now grown to 26 countries and territories around the world. Brazil, quite candidly, right now is having rapid growth. They're one of the fastest growing countries. So uh, we collaborate and cooperate with the other countries under an organizing body known as the Financial Planning Standards Board. And we work collaboratively with them to, uh, you know, to work on marketing efforts. You should know, though, 
that the money that CFP board collects to promote CFP certification in the United States uh, only is used within the U.S. So ours is more of a contributing and participation effort. Our communications team works with the communication teams of CFP certifying bodies um, around, uh, around the world. Um, Joe asks, what suggestions do you have for people who want to get involved in volunteer opportunities? Joe, great, great question. Look, uh, volunteers are the lifeline of CFP Board. We have over 2,000 volunteers in a variety of different capacities. We have a number of opportunities that nearly anyone can participate in. If you're newer to the profession, we would encourage you uh, to become a mentor to candidates on the path to CFP certification, especially if you've just become certified, you've been through it, uh, you can be quite helpful there. Or volunteer to support our women's initiatives as a WIN advocate, or who, and these are folks who help spread the word among younger women and girls that financial planning is a great career option. I agree with that. You do, have you done that? No, I have not done that. I, I informally mentor, but yeah. You do informally I mentor. Do Tell me, do you find it rewarding? It's extremely rewarding. Um, you know, a lot of women and younger younger girls don't realize um, the level of. It, we, we do live investment management, but we are very much a relationship-based business. And if you're someone who likes interacting with clients, helping people reach their financial goals, um, helping families build wealth, it's extremely rewarding. And so I'm a huge advocate for women um, to enter this industry. It has a lot of flexibility. You, you think about what, what happened during COVID-19. A lot of my colleagues had the ability to work from home and manage those multiple priorities of working full-time and taking care of children. Um, so I, I'm a huge advocate for this profession, um, for, for women particularly. Thank you for, for giving a plug there, because uh, our research that we've done on barriers to becoming CFP certified tells us that candidates for CFP certification who have a relationship with somebody who's already certified have a 10% higher pass rate, like completion success rate, than those who don't. So it's uh, it's very important. And so, Camila, thank you for that. For those of you who might be looking for longer terms on one of our commissions or councils, we typically identify candidates for open positions toward the end of the year, so now's a great time to let us know and submit an application. You can do that. There's a recurring theme here, cfp.net slash volunteer. Looking at the questions that are coming in here, um, Todd asks, are there sources for starting or running your own independent fee-only financial planning practice, not with a broker-dealer? Uh, we work closely. First of all, let's just say CFP Board is business model and compensation neutral. But uh, the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors is the organization for fee-only advisors, Todd, and I'm sure they would be happy to uh, help you. Um, next question from Marvin. Is there any consideration to discuss a combined credential with AICPA? Look, we have a great uh, working relationship with our friends uh, at AICPA. I personally um, uh, work with the senior executives there. Uh, we collaborate on uh, items from time to time. While we don't have any particular interest, we think that uh, we think that it's a very powerful combination for a C certified public accountant who wants to be involved in financial planning to go ahead and earn the CFP designation. And we have an accelerated path 
uh, that helps make that more efficient. So we have an education requirement, but if you're a CPA or a CFA and several other uh, designations, you can just take the capstone course and then sit for the exam. So I would encourage you uh, to, think, uh, to think about that. Um, next question here. Elliot asks, what's up with the marketing campaign? Camila, would you take that question? Sure. So the CFP Board's public awareness campaign just wrapped up its spring 2021 advertising flight. I expect that most of you saw the TV ad run on many national and cable networks. The latest campaign was titled, With a CFP Professional, and shows consumers what a difference a CFP professional can make in their lives. The campaign is focused on increasing awareness of the value of working with CFP professionals and encouraging the public to visit our letsmakeaplan.org website to find a CFP professional to work with. Since 2011, we've invested more than $90 million in our public awareness campaigns and we've seen our unaided awareness of the CFP certification among our target audience grow to a high of 34%. So it's working. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Camila, for taking that. My friend Neil out in Arizona asks, does the board track whether the increase in diverse CFP professionals, Neil, thank you for using the proper use of the mark there. Uh, does the increase in the diverse, uh, in the number of diverse CFP professionals that we're reaching, are they serving more diverse clients? And Camila, we were talking about that before we went on the air. So, so, yes, so say we more about that. Yes, we were. So we, we do see there is value in di diverse um, CFP professionals working with diverse clients. But it doesn't always have to be that way. Um, we do know that with the CFP um, coursework and, and holistic planning focus, it allows you to support any family. Um, it's up to the advisor or the CFP professional to understand the cultural competencies and differences of different ethnicities and backgrounds. But we hope with the work we're doing with the Center for Financial Planning, um, academic research colloquium and the papers that we provide there, client psychology, that any CFP professional can work with any client and have the tools and resources to be successful. Thank you, Camila. I, I, a number of these are kind of in your wheelhouse, so I'm coming back to you right here again. Um, this is a question related. Blake has a question about nominating uh, and the composition of the board. And he makes a statement, uh, let me just make sure I've got this. Uh, should there be a diversity in the size of firms represented on the board of directors? Why is the criteria only for the very largest firms if smaller RAAs are the fastest growing sector in the industry? So I'm going to let you start. Doug, you may have a point of view, and I have a point of view as well. So let's take on Blake's question assertion that we're only, uh, the board of directors only has uh, large firms on it. So great question, Blake, and I, and I think I agree with you. There should be a diver diversity in firm size. Um, Blake, I'm, this is Camila speaking to you from a firm that has a total of five people. <laughs> um, so I think it's important to have, you know, startup RIAs, mid-sized firms, large-sized firms, wirehouse and broker-dealers because they all bring valuable expertise, experience, and thought to the board. Um, and I'm going to kick it off to Doug because he has some, uh, some stats as to our board composition and how we do um, arrange to be able to um, understand all sizes yeah, of so, financial so, planning practices. So it's a really good question, Blake, and I think it, it uh, really hits hard relative to why we chose to put out there the four different focus areas that we were looking for this year. We didn't put those out there because we want large firms or because we want academics or we want this or that. We put it out there because we have people on the on board today that are rotating off that, that were put on the board at some point because they had that particular experience. And so 
you might be pleased if you are a small RAA to know that right now I think there's six of us who are working with small RAAs and uh, and uh, there were two that were with larger firms that are rotating off this year and since there is a significant number of CFP professionals that, that are part of the larger firms they have a, a unique kind of a difference relative to what maybe a different RAA might be um, we want to hear and have the perspective of everyone, not just the diversity of race and religion and everything else. It's a matter of uh, getting a complete, total, uh, diverse board. And I can tell you from just finishing this board meeting, um, it, it creates an incredible dynamic. It, it, it opens my eyes. It opens other eyes as we listen. We think we have a vision or view of what something is supposed to be, and yet another candidate with a, a different way a different you know who who might be working at a different company or might come from a different perspective culturally or otherwise they open up our eyes and so we're we're very very committed to that and it's a good question and we appreciate your answer definitely. you know the only other thing we're we're coming up here toward the top of the hour but the only other thing that I would add to uh, Blake's question is that the obligation of board members both by our mission but most importantly by our tax status is to work for the in the interest of the public now you know in order to do that people we need people with different points of view so it's not a how do i want to say it it's not a representative democracy we don't expect camila to come to the board table and strongly defend the point of the view of the small five-person RIA, but she brings that worldview. And, and because our mission is to benefit the public, we don't do that at the staff level from, from K Street on Washington, D.C. We do that through the 90,000 CFP professionals across the United States. And so it's important that the board table represent the different worldviews but all board members come with an expectation that they're going to make decisions and engage in discussion with that public interest uh, perspective out front. I agree. Good. All right. I think uh, maybe we have uh, – let me just look here real quick and see uh, – you know, uh, John asked, what is the number and percentage of certificates that are fee-only versus non-fee-only? I think at the last point, we've got a couple of staff members here, something like six or 8,000 of the CFP community identify potentially uh, as, uh, as fee-only. Um, all right. Uh, I think um, we're just about out of time. Uh, I really appreciate everybody who's tuned in. Doug, what parting words would you have for us? Well, Kevin, I'd like to thank the CFP professional community for its support of the CFP board and the CFP certification. We're very excited about the profession's future, and I believe the CFP board's new strategic plan will serve the profession and benefit the public. And we hope you'll all consider how you can get involved with all this great work. CFP Board achieves its mission through the benefit of the public, through the work of our CFP professionals. And hopefully we demonstrated that today, and uh, we continue to do that um, every day. A mission is something we can't achieve on our own, and we're grateful to everyone who shared their time, their energy, and their support for our initiatives. And I also want to thank the CFP professional community and everyone who supports it. CFP board and the center have many important priorities and in initiatives. I'm thrilled that we're making progress on advancing diversity and inclusion in the profession, and I encourage you to join our work. There are many ways you can get involved, both at the individual level and as leaders within the firms and orgs that you are a part of. I hope that you plan to join us November 17th through November 19th at our next Diversity Summit that will be held virtually. Registration will be opening soon. And the next addition to the center's series of reports addressing diversity in the profession will also be forthcoming. 
You know, thank you so much, both Doug and Camila. With us today, Camila Elliott. She is our chair elect for 2021, will be chair of the board next year in 2022. And Doug King is chair of the board. I appreciate both of your leadership and I thank everyone on the board of directors for the dedication to the mission and the commitment to CFP certification. In closing, I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today. A recording of this presentation will be posted to CFP Board's website within the next few business days. And CFP Board will follow up individually with those who ask questions that we did not get to during this broadcast. From Park City, Utah, have a nice afternoon, everybody.